Caressus feels different. For better and for worse, it feels different than most other games. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Caressus Quest for the Elements, a game currently on Kickstarter. I'll have a link down below, and this is a prototype. Everything you see here, rules, components, all that stuff subject to change, although if you're looking at this board and thinking it's a misprint, that's, that's intentional due to variable board setups and all of that. Let's dive into what this game, let's talk about it again, prototype, rules, components, subject to change, link on down below on Kickstarter. This is Caressus Quest for the Elements, which is a tile laying game in which the players are going to pick from a few different factions, asymmetric factions with different abilities, and then they're going to go wandering around in a combination between almost like a Tsuro combined with a dungeon crawl, a bunch of things kind of mixed together in one. In Caressus, you're going to be wandering around the tiles, flipping tiles, paying energy for the tiles you flip. The tiles are going to cost energy, which is going to be the main resource you have over here. You're going to start the game with 12 energy and you want to make sure that you keep that in check so you don't ever go into a freeze turn where you basically lose your turn to recover your energy so you want to be mindful of that as you wander around you're going to be gathering tiles with the ultimate goal being that of getting your locations across these four these four over here these uh these shrines you want to get the shrines on the board there's gonna be four of them in different colors and there's some criteria as to how you get your hands on them and to that end you're going to be wandering around trying to follow paths paying energy as you flip different tiles and wander around the board Wherever you end your turn, you're going to get the benefit of the various tiles you lie on, for better or for worse. You're going to be getting whether it's you know whether it's cards or whether it's uh, resources or recovering your energy. You're going to be wandering around on these locations, taking different benefits, slowly putting your guards down on different locations, and potentially your shamans as well as the game progresses. You're going to be doing that to gain control of the tiles, to have a little bit more agency, and it's going to be one of the ways you get your hands on the shrines in the game. You see, the way you get your hands onto these shrines is as you're wandering around. Again, this dungeon crawl adjacent. Let's put this over here. Let's wander over here. We're going to have to pay an energy to move counter to the arrow. These blue tiles, there's an upstream movement, so wherever you see that arrow, you have to pay an energy to move against the current. Although, if I was playing as blue over here, I don't get paid to go against the current. Whenever I move against the current, I have that freebie. That goes back to the asymmetric factions, each coming to play with their own abilities. So you're slowly creating the path as you wander, you're slowly placing down tiles, you're wandering around the board trying to get to these shrines in the corner, and when you get to the shrines in the corner, let's switch to this person over here, when I get to the shrines in the corner, I can go ahead and peek at it, and if I control a shrine of that color, uh, a tile of that color, which I do, this is blue over here, I currently have a guard on blue, if I control a shrine of that color, a, a tile of that color, I can go ahead and place a control marker on that shrine to show that I currently main control, maintain control of this, and I can now get the benefit of its abilities. Each of the shrines comes with a powerful ability that you'll have access to once you get your shaman onto that shrine. So you're going to get the benefit of moving your shaman. Let's move my shaman over there. Once you get your shaman onto the shrine, you're going to get the benefit of the shrine. And the other way that you can control shrines is by knowing, by having the shrine face up and controlling three tiles of that color. So for example, if we swap this person over here with him, let's say they take control of that tile, then at this point, yellow now controls three blue tiles, and so without ever even going here, they can now control blue as well. So the game gives you two pathways to how you control the shrines as you wander around the board, engaging with these various ability spots over here, taking the abilities on the actions, eventually getting to various disaster tiles somewhere. Here we go. Eventually you'll have the opportunity to wander into disaster tiles, and by opportunity I mean just generally bad thing, disaster tiles are not as good as you wander around the board, and that's high level caresses. There's a few other things going on, there's your, your strength over here, you're going to be managing your strength track as you go through the game, there's going to be your health as well, the health of your main character, there's going to be your energy that slowly resets, there's ways to recover it, when you land on certain tiles you'll recover it, when you uh, find that shrine you'll go ahead and get your energy back up, there's going to be player aids that cover all the useful information you need to know over here, the things you can trade cards in, there's a whole deck of cards we didn't even go over, a whole deck of ability cards over here that give you different things you can do in the game, different abilities will have uh, different costs to the cards to play them, energy costs or, or resource costs from these cards over here, and then different abilities you can utilize on these cards. You know, this artifact has the power to stop the exploration. Your enemies cannot place new tiles before you take a new turn. That can buy you the time you need to win the game if, well, game is approaching, or if you just don't want them to get access to something and you want to cut off their pathway, perhaps locking off a pathway. If you have a player over here, depending on how you place your tiles, if you're slowly closing in on them, you may have the opportunity opportunity to stop them from moving so that you can cross over them and now they're looking at a dead end instead so that that single time placement can have a big impact on the game depending on what you place when what you play when you play them you'll also have these cards over here which can be gathering these are various elements you can trade in elements for various benefits and again that's all listed very nicely on your player aid 
your player aid is going to give you this option over here, which tells you what the cards can be traded in for, showing you all the options of how you can trade in trade in sets of elements for cards over here, how you can trade them in to heal yourself, how you can trade in the dead cards for more energy. There's going to be stone cards that don't help you with the other trade-ins, but can be traded in for energy. This covers all of that, including the various uh, shrine abilities, the four different shrine abilities, which often have movement impacts. You know, you can go ahead and if you're on water, you can teleport from water tiles to water tiles. I can go ahead and jump from here to another to water tile on the board, helping me move across the board pretty quickly. Or perhaps rotating tiles or adding one to my battle score. There can be different impacts that the shrines will have, as well as showing you the options that cost energy and the ways to recover your energy. On the reverse side over here, it's going to show you a bunch of things about how the tiles work, how to place down tiles, all the shrine stuff. These player aids give you all the information you need. The last thing I probably should have covered is the start of your turn involves you rolling a die to determine how many movement points you get that game, how many movement spots. Every tile has a maximum of three movement spots, and you're going to be moving around the board in Caressus. There are ways to uh, mitigate bad rolls. If you roll poorly enough, ones or twos, you'll get additional movement tokens. And in fact, some of the factions, this faction over here, receive a movement point, which is immediately usable if your movement score is less than four. So there are ways to mitigate around bad rolls and ensure you can wander around the board in Cressus as you slowly try to hunt down the shrines, as you take control of tiles, as you place your shamans, as you play the various cards that will help you get to your goal. And that's effectively Cressus Quest of the Elements high level overview. So let's talk about this. Let's review this game. Let's go over the, the pros, the cons, ease of play, all those different things, starting off with ease of play, which is the rule book is... I, I would argue the rulebook is unnecessarily long for the game complexity. Caressus presents a fairly simple game at its core. If you're familiar with a lot of common game elements, uh, dungeon crawling, uh, tile laying, different elements of, of, game, of game design, this has a lot of basics in it. At the same time, it mixes things up in a way that feels different, and that often does result in, well, having to have a longer rulebook than I would imagine. The rulebook's closer to around 30 pages, around 10 is other play modes or player counts and things like that, but it's still going to have a decent amount of rules, higher than I would expect for the complexity of the game. The battle part is a little bit unnecessarily fiddly, we'll get back into that in the terms of what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, but overall, while Crestus is not a hard game to teach, while it's not a hard game to play, I would say the rulebook is longer than I would expect. Uh, given the game. Past that, plays pretty quickly, takes up a reasonable amount of table space, and all good things there. As far as player count, this is a 1-4 to four player game. I have not looked into the solo mode. I've played this at 2 and 3 players. Uh, but yeah, 1-4 to four player game. I would say 2 and 3 I'm torn on. Uh, 3 players gives you that extra player, which means more interaction, more opportunity for battles, or interactions between the players, between the players and the guards, having more things on the board, having tiles flip up faster, very shrines flip up faster, so you can take control of them by controlling tiles instead of heading there. So 3 players opens up the board a bit more. Uh, uh, two players is just faster and gives you mostly the same experience in a shorter playtime. So I'd say I don't have a strong preference at either player count. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, a few different things here. First of all, managing your resources in the game. That energy and being on top of your energy, it's a resource that you start the game with 12, and so to that end, it feels like you can spend it pretty quickly. Every tile you draw is going to cost an energy. A whole bunch of things in the game are going to cost you energy as you go through it, and slowly but surely, your energy is going to start fading, and you need to be mindful of that as you try to figure out uh, going upstream. Going upstream is a big deal over here. Going against the current, that will cost you energy, but it can, save you, it can save you valuable points of time when you go against the current in the right situations. And that resource won't tick down that fast, but then it'll start ticking down, and then you realize you have to be in control of it. Additionally, the cards you're going to utilize, uh, these these uh, stone cards or gem cards, as you gather those and figure out what to trade them in for, trading them in for more cards, trading them in for the, some of the other benefits or whatnot, there's generally a decent amount of resource management in the game that you need to be mindful of in what is otherwise a pure tile laying experience. And the fact that there's two ways to control the shrines, the shrines, which is how you win the game, the fact that they give you two ways, not just getting there, which can be tedious, wandering around the entire board, being mindful of all the locations, utilizing the abilities to rotate tiles, to do what you need to do, to try to to teleport or any of these other options to get from location A to location B, from the cars you utilize, there's a whole bunch of ways you can get around, but ultimately, having two ways of getting the shrines, having a second option where you can go ahead and just control those colors gives you a bit of choice. You know, which shrines will you, will you just try to make your way towards and which ones will you just try to control the train. And so that gives you a little flexibility in pursuing what is ultimately the end game condition in this game. And controlling the shrines can feel powerful. Those abilities, which I briefly touched upon, the uh, the extra combat, the, the extra movement, the jumping, teleporting, all those options that the shrines give you, they do feel impactful using their abilities at the right time for the right, you know, jump across the board. My favorite is the jumping between the blue tiles. If you can situate that well, you can pop off a shrine and immediately teleport to somewhere somebody else has started exploring. Although it is a double-edged sword because 
the blue tiles are there for everyone, which means everyone can jump around the board, but it can feel powerful if you control the shrine and use its abilities at the right moment. And this has that general tile laying aspect where it's fun to place down tiles, it's fun to go ahead and explore, it's fun to figure out the next option, to move your character, to draw three gemstones, to get two energy, to take the action of the tile you land on, and to occasionally dabble in combats between the players, which brings me directly to things I don't like, which is the game's combat is particularly fiddly. Now, I think the game in general is a little fiddly. I think there's some aspects of the game that, in its effort to be a different game than what you're typically used to, and in an effort to stand out and not be your typical Tsuro or Indigo or any of those, and to in some way differentiate itself from both a dungeon crawler and a tile layer, it does combine the two in a way that feels very different, but I think that's both a pro and a con. The combat in particular feels excessively fiddly in what it's doing in the execute of, of bluffing, of declaring your combat, of spending your stuff. It feels like unnecessarily complicated for the game weight that the Crestus is otherwise bringing to the table. And while the combat to me is the worst defender, I would say in general, various elements of Caressus feel a little fiddly. Uh, even just even something as disaster tiles. The disaster tiles I don't like. I don't feel they add to the experience. I feel they slow down the dungeon crawling in a way that doesn't make me feel like it's interesting or cool or different. It's just an obstacle that kind of gets in the way. While Caressus gives you the opportunity to explore this board in different ways that can be fun at times and can give you the opportunity to figure out the optimal pathway forward, there are some aspects that just don't add to my experience. And then lastly, I'm not really a huge fan of the graphic design of the art. Caressus doesn't pull me in heavily in terms of the, the board design, the tile design. The colors are there at a high level, but past that, it's not pulling me in from a visual standpoint. Again, prototype, all things subject to change, but not currently pulling me in visually. As far as I can see, others not liking, this is a hybrid game and it feels very hybrid in what it's doing for better or for worse. If you like dungeon crawlers, I can't say whether you'll like Caressus. If you like tile laying games, I can't say if you're like Caressus. It has aspects of multiple genres mixed together in a way that does make it feel different, but also makes it harder for me to know exactly who the target audience is. Is it somebody who likes both of them? Is it just fun and accessible? It does things in ways that are engaging. It has that puzzly element that you want from a game, but it doesn't have the direct comparison for better and for worse to be able to know exactly who this game is a fit for. As far as final thoughts, Caressus is is fun but fiddly at the same time. Caressus gives you that simple engaging element of pulling a tile, of wandering around the board, of taking your actions, of trying to optimize, of gathering your hand of cards, of using abilities, both your inherent faction ability, of using the card abilities, trying to maneuver the board, situate things up, pop them over from one location to another, rotate tiles, all those things, control tiles, go to shrines, all those elements result in a game that is enjoyable. It has those fun moments in it, which are just, hey, look at me, I'm doing the thing to try to win and I'm having fun doing so. But I don't know if it necessarily stands out past feeling different. It feels different, but it doesn't feel different in a way that is inherently better. It feels different in a way that makes it not be directly comparable to other games. Some of the elements are a little fiddlier than they need to be and could benefit from some streamlining while perhaps keeping the core idea of what it is, a combination between I don't know, uh, a Legend of Drizzt and Indigo, a combination between Atsuro and Legend of Drizzt combined together, giving you elements of both while feeling completely different at the same time. For me, this is a three out of five. It's a fun game, but not one that immediately stands out past being, hey, this was fun to play and I enjoyed my time with it. As far as other game recommendations, Indigo is one I mentioned a few times during this review, and I think that's a good starting point comparison. If you like the general idea of laying down tiles, of creating a pathway, Indigo will have that. It's Suro as well. Indigo has always been my preference, which is why I tend to recommend that. You're going to be slowly creating a board as you draw tiles, also hexagons, placing them down, and creating a structure of the board as you move just these little tokens, little beads across from location to location. And then secondly, Carcassonne as well. Carcassonne is going to drift a little bit more heavily into the tile laying and building a board and building a grid while having elements that are similar to Crassus in the sense that there's a degree of area control with a sense of combat that is not heavily in your face the same way it might be in a dungeon crawler. And that's similar to what I get from Crassus. While there is direct competition here in a way that you don't find in Carcassonne, it's still more abstracted and more dialed down than what you would get from a true in-your-face head-to-head experience. And so Indigo and Carcassonne are going to be my two recommendations similar to this game. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this review helpful. Link to the Kickstarter down below. And as always, have a good one.